Good morning, church. I'm Pastor Terry Milstead. It is wonderful to be in worship with you this morning. Pastor Tony Jones is with us, the executive director from Camp Sumatongo. We'll hear from him later. Pastor Dale Clem is right here with us in worship. And if you are worshiping with us online, you can say hello to Reed Turner, our associate pastor, who's with you in the comments. Now, as we begin worship, would you stand as you are able for our call to worship? Soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head. May like him, like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. And now if you will remain standing for our hymn of praise, the king of love my shepherd is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, universal and apostolic, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. I want to thank everyone for your continued support of this church through your prayers, your presence, your tithes, your witness, and your service. If you would like to leave an offering this morning, there are plates on the rail and there are several ways that you can give online if that is more convenient for you. Thank you again for all the different ways that you have supported this church. One of the strengths of our United Methodist Connection is that your giving to this church is able to support not only our own ministries here in Alabaster, but also the ministries of our North Alabama Annual Conference. This includes support for Camp Sumatonga. Thank you for making this possible. We hope that you will consider sending a special young person in your life to camp this summer maybe during one of the two weeks in July when our own Miss Berta will be volunteering there. I also would like to invite you, if you would like to make a special donation to Camp Sumatonga this morning, you can leave a donation with the church and put Camp Sumatonga in the four field. I'm sure that they would appreciate your financial support. But Tony will talk more about the other things that are very helpful to them in their ministry there during his message. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the special, sacred places you have given us like Camp Sumatonga. May its grounds be filled again in 2021 with campers and pilgrims of all ages. May all who visit Sumatonga find rest and peace, love and laughter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
You may be seated. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, on this morning, Good Shepherd Sunday, we come before you confident that you are truly and indeed our shepherd, a good and caring and protective father who leads us where you would have us go if we would but follow. This morning we are thankful to gather here in this place that is so special to us for worship. We are grateful to be with our church family. We are thankful that we can worship and spend this hour reconnecting to one another and to you in a way that fills our souls, that makes us ready for the ministry that you have called each and every one of us into this week. Lord, we take just a short pause, just a moment of silence this morning to lift up to you those cares and concerns that are on our hearts and minds. Lord, we ask you to be present in these situations and with these people who have come to our minds in this moment. And more importantly, perhaps, we ask that you would show us how we can be your hands and feet in ministry to them. Where we might be weak, we ask you help us be strong. Where we might be meek, we ask that you would help us be bold. Give us your peace and your joy and your hope to overflowing that we might be a balm applied to the souls and hearts of those that you put us in contact with this week. Lord, we now join our voices together in the prayer that you taught your followers, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I'd like to invite Michelle Oglesby forward for our children's moment. Maybe it's gonna fade. Oh, good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Well, we're gonna do our memory verse that we've been doing all month, and I know y'all are probably pretty good at this. It's from Ephesians 3:18. And y'all wanna just dive in, we'll just do it together. How wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. Ephesians 3:18. Awesome. Well, I have Blakely helping me today, and we are going to build a wall. As you can tell, it's about let's see, it's about knee high, and the story today comes from Nehemiah. <laughs> So, um, every time you hear the word wall, I want you to build a wall, okay? All right, and, and Blakely's going to build the wall for you. All right, there's a man named Nehemiah. He was a Jewish man of God who did a giant job. 
He led the Jews in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a holy city, and inside that city there was a special place of worship called the temple. And um, before the invaders tore down the walls of Jerusalem, it was a thriving place. People traveled from everywhere to worship at the temple. Invaders came and tore the walls down and the doors burned and that protected the you know the the walls and the doors because they were burned down and damaged they weren't protected there it wasn't safe many people left the city and sought refuge somewhere else but before nehemiah came some people had gone back to jerusalem and they built up um, the temple but still, the walls of Jerusalem needed, to be, needed some work. So you have to have high walls like a fort, you know, to, to protect everything. If you've ever built a sandcastle before, and you know you build the walls up high so the water doesn't knock the sandcastle down. Well, the big walls would keep the water from tearing down the sandcastle, and the big walls of the city would keep the enemies from harming the people in the places inside the city. So without the wall, Jerusalem was in trouble. God knew that. So he called Nehemiah from a faraway land called Persia. And Nehemiah worked for the king of Persia. He wanted to go see Jerusalem for himself. Even though he was afraid to ask the king for help, he asked anyway. Nehemiah knew that God's will was to get the walls built back up. And Nehemiah wanted to do that for God no matter what. So the king granted Nehemiah the request. Nehemiah traveled to Jerusalem in secret and walked the walls around through the city and saw the destruction for himself. He was deeply troubled by the destruction. He cried. He fasted, and he prayed to God for help to change this. He started wide away building the wall. Some of his enemies were against rebuilding it, but they built it back really fast. The city was safe again, and the Jewish people were happy that God brought Nehemiah to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah never stopped praying and asking for forgiveness for the people's wrongdoings and for his. And Jerusalem's, the wall was, was built back up. So let us all strive to be like Nehemiah. Pray to God uh, even during times of distress and struggle. Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you so much for the example you have given us in the story of Nehemiah. Thank you for giving us wisdom, peace, hope, and love and help to do your will. Help us to always pray before making big plans. Lead and guide us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Michelle. If any children would like to go to Children's Church, Miss Rachel is right here and she will take them now. Now, if you will stand for our hymn of preparation, The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want.
Before we hear today's scripture, would you join me in the prayer for illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture comes from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of my God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king had spoken to me. Then they said, Let us start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Gresham the Arab heard of it, they mocked and ridiculed us, saying, What is this that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven is the one who will give us success, and we his servants are going to start building but you have no share or claim or historic right in Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tony Jones and I'm the executive director. Let me just say what a blessing it is to be with each of you today here worshiping at this wonderful church. Uh, for those that are online, I, I encourage you to come be a part of this congregation, whether it's the 8.30 service, the 9 o'clock service, 11, equally all offer something incredible for you and your family and ministry. If, if architectural will get you uh, a, a visit in the kingdom of God, this place will do it, right? <laughs> so we're, we're grateful for wonderful buildings, but we're grateful for each of you. So uh, God bless you and thank you. Greetings from our holy and sacred ground of Camp Sumatonga. It's a pleasure to be here. I was slated to be introduced at Trinity United Methodist Church in Homewood, and, and at that time Brian Erickson was leading a worship service with a sermon series on Nehemiah. And, and I'd had a hard time at that point having this uh, articulated, that I, the feelings that I was having. I, I was having a hard time putting into words all the emotions that I was having being the new executive director at Camp Sumatonga. And, and he shared some scripture, and it's the scripture that you heard today. And, and it comes from Nehemiah chapter 2. And it was everything that I was feeling as a camp director. Everything that was going on in my life. And so I, I, I was able then to formulate what God was impressing on my heart and what I now will share with you today. Before I get into that, let me just say that I do feel connected to Alabaster. Um, whenever I decided not to go play football out of high school and uh, turned down a couple of scholarships, I wanted to learn a trade and and I got a job with a, with a company called Allied Products. And I'm not sure if anyone's heard of that, but they had a, a lime plant in Montevallo. And so for me, living in Fultondale, driving from Fultondale to Montevallo every day and then back home again, Alabaster was kind of this place like, okay, I made it. You know, I'm almost there. <laughs> it was a good stopping point. When I was even younger, my family and I, before the interstate was finished, we would travel down 31, and it was like, we can't wait to get the alabaster because Mama was going to buy something from Jack's to eat. <laughs> so, so alabaster has a, a, dear, a dear place in my heart. Uh, not, not only the connection as a youth and then as a young adult, learning everything that there was about things I didn't know in the construction world or in the lime industry or, or, or even in the, in the cement division, 
of that same company. But I have a greater connection to Alabaster first. Uh, Terry and I worked several Emmaus walks together, and we talked about what a joy it is to be a part of that ministry that takes place at Camp Sumatanga and how much we long to be back in that ministry. Uh, Dale and I had the good fortune to travel. I, I was part of the Baltic Chrysalis number two that traveled to that region. And, and I told this story at, at the earlier service, and I, I think I, it's worth telling again. Dale, Dale came in uh, later than we had arrived at the seminary that we were staying in Estonia. And so it was probably 12 or 1 o'clock, but we all waited up on Dale. I mean, who wouldn't wait up on Dale, right? I thought that'd be funnier. They don't care to wait up on you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Guy in the back said, I'll be in bed. <laughs> so we were waiting up on Dale, and Dale, Dale arrived, and Dale, first thing he did, he said, well, let's, let's go to the sauna. I miss the sauna so much. Let's go to the sauna. So, so there were 10 or 11 of, of us in the sauna, and he was telling a story at that time of a book that he was writing and, and, he, and he started at the beginning like most books he started and then the and then I guess he got into the first chapter and then he got in the second chapter and every time he was telling the story and a new character would be created he would he would use the ladle and he dipped more water on the rock you know and and, and so the, all this steam was created and so I don't know if it was about the sixth chapter or the seventh chapter that I was about ready to pass out but <laughs> But, but I, I didn't finish the book, right? Because I was like, man, i got to get out. You're killing me. Your tolerance for heat is a lot better than mine. So it was a wonderful time in ministry in the Baltic region. And uh, those wonderful memories that create so much. We also have another connection. Warner and Elaine, uh, great friends of, of the family, uh, have been incredible mentors and people we love dearly, members here. And so it's beautiful to almost feel like you're coming home. So thank you for your hospitality and your love. Um, it, it was kind of neat to share those stories and all the creation, uh, but, but after I had gone through this working environment and, and, and a change in my life, I met my wonderful wife, and then we decided to raise our family in, in Aniana and make a name for ourselves. She became an educator. She's now assistant principal. And... Um, I, after working several years in the healthcare industry and in nuclear medicine, decided I felt this calling in my life, and so I went to seminary at Emory University. But, but one thing that I never quit feeling, even though I had changed occupations, I never quit feeling like there was this call on my life in ministry, in Sumatanga, and, and to uh, a place even like Alabaster First. So as I became a part of this wonderful ministry project. Fast forward to several church appointments later and millions of prayers and hundreds of weddings and, and I, what I joke to be a few pounds, but that's a lie, right? <laughs> we, we joked, uh, I, I, you put on that freshman 15 or freshman 5, I put on that COVID 20, but, <laughs> but I'm still here. I'm still here. And um, all of that led me up to this ability to maybe possibly, with God's help, lead Sumatanga into the, a healthy future. And, and it, was, it was everything that I just described that gave me hope in that process. Now, I don't know if you think about, we, Shannon and I just laugh sometimes at looking back in our life and seeing how God has directed us on certain paths to take on certain roles and how God's never left us alone. God's always had our back. Even in the times where we thought they were difficult, even in the great joys of our life, God was directing our paths. God was pouring into us the hope that we needed to be at this position in our life, at the helm of Camp Sumatanga. It was that same hope that was read in the story of Nehemiah. It's that same hope as this young girl built this wall of blocks and we were reminded of construction and how it starts from the ground up and then it has a good base and then it's, it's, that base is needed to sustain the rest of the wall. It's hope that Nehemiah felt as he felt God's love pouring into his calling. Now, I'm no Nehemiah, but I do share I do share in that story. And as I told you, I was sitting, listening to Brian preach that message that day and that scripture somehow articulated the pain and burden I was feeling. 
Nehemiah had a position of, of great hope. He was, had a position of honor and privilege. He was the cupbearer to the king. Now, the cupbearer to the king is a big deal, right? you got a seat at the table. You're involved in all the decisions. When the banquet is held, you're there. And, and you're, in, you're in the process of building a kingdom. And so he, he had strived all these years to reach this level, and now he had arrived, and what had happened? His nation lay in ruins. His nation lay in ruins. And his heart hurt. Now, I said I'm no Nehemiah, but I, I'm here to tell you my heart hurt. I was at a church serving a, a church. We'd gotten to a place where we had obtained, I thought, great spiritual health. And we had, we had poured into one another and we had loved one another. And, and it was a place where I, I, thought, I thought that I could stay there for quite a long time. We were doing ministry side by side with good laity that was seeing the call placed on their heart to take greater leadership in the church. Financially, we were in great shape. It's the only church I served where there was no debt. No debt. So corona, corona hurt us a little bit, but no, it didn't because we had positioned ourselves to be in a good situation. It was a great appointment, let me say. And then like Nehemiah, I felt this call. Sumatanga laid in ruins. And so I, I felt God calling my heart to something different. Somebody reached out to me and said, I think you'd be a good candidate. Would you please apply to, for this position? And, and I prayed about it, and, uh, and, and I thought, well, that'd be nice, but I'm looking at a position that had nine executive directors in 11 years. Somebody, can somebody say, whoop, whoop? That's ugly, brother. And I don't know if you know this, but that's not a healthy consistency in any corporation. And that's not something they advocate. And so I thought, well, what was it, what sickness, what, what disease was it that caused that turnover at the leadership? And so I, I, I started asking questions, and I started learning more. And, and, and so the, the trustees had all been changed, and then they, they redid how they did business, and they, they shrank the size of the board, and, 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 then, and then they had a trustees that now had the vision and the mission of Sumatanga in place. And I thought, maybe, just maybe, this is something that can happen. And so I applied, and, and after a pretty extensive interview... My name came up. And I had one of the individuals in this interview ask me this. He said, why on earth would you take this position? <laughs> and uh, my, first, my first thought was, man, I don't know. I must be sideways or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, remember the Titans uh, uh, with Denzel Washington said, boy, you must be outside your mind. <laughs> I must have been outside my mind. But like Nehemiah, my heart was hurting. My heart was hurting. So Nehemiah, when his heart was hurting, he went to the king. The king noticed that his burden was heavy, and he looked at his heart, and he said, Son, what is the matter with you? Nehemiah said, My heart is bursting at the thought of my nation laying in ruins. And so he said, Can I go? Can I have time off to go rebuild the wall of my nation? Yeah, the wall provided security and safety, but it was a status as well. And he didn't want his nation to suffer anymore. And so he had the time off that he needed. And then he even went one step further because he went back to the king. And he said, can, can you give me a pass so that I may have safe travel? In other words, can you lighten the load of me getting there? Can you, can you give me a pass so that I may go to certain people and get provisions so that I may build the wall? And the king said, sure, here it is. You, you, I, I, I need you to be whole again. And so I left Athens, Alabama, and I come to Camp Sumatanga. I live at the foot of the cross, literally. I, I said that because there's a cross on the hill, and I live below, below the cross. And it's a beautiful place. It's holy and sacred. So when the guy said, why on earth would you take this job? The only thing I could think was, do you remember the commercial with Coach Bryant? Do, is, do we have any Alabama fans in here? All right, three. Four, five, six. There you go. Come on up. Those online, everybody online, raise their hand. Coach Bryant did a commercial, and they asked him, how was it that you come to 
be the coach at Alabama. And he said, well, it's like this. He said, he said, you remember when you were young and you were outside and you were playing with your friends in the neighborhood? And, and it was about dinner time, and so the, your mom would reach your head out the door and she would holler, right? Call your name. And he said, what did you do? You stopped what you were doing and you went home. And for, for Coach Bryant, being hired at Alabama was like mama calling, is what he said. And, and in a similar way, uh, I, my being at Sumatanga was like mama calling. Hey, look, I've spent some amazing times at Sumatanga. My home church is Lester Memorial, so we're, we're up the hill from Sumatanga. So I felt responsible was my answer that I gave this gentleman. I felt responsible to Sumatanga's success. I was 20 minutes away growing up. My, my children, two of my children were baptized there. All three were confirmed there. They had gone through a remember your baptism service there. They had their confirmation there. We had held youth events there. We had been on all kinds of Emmaus walks there. Sumatanga means the world to me. All three of my daughters, I'm a father of three girls, all three of my daughters have worked there on staff during the summer. My middle daughter found her husband there. So when Tsuma Tonga called, it's like mama calling you home. Now, I don't know if you know the story of Nehemiah deeply, but Nehemiah had some things he had to overcome. And in, in going back to his nation, he had to develop a plan. We've had to do the same thing at Sumatanga. It's 1,700 acres of woods, and the woods are constantly fighting back the buildings. There's 70 facility buildings that were wore out before COVID got here. There's a 55-acre lake. And by the way, if you like fishing, a gentleman caught a nine-and-a-half-pound bass about a month and a half ago. This young man woke up for the first time. You like that, didn't you, brother? Come on, get your pop to bring you fishing. <laughs> it is a beautiful place. It's an amazing place. But it has some limitations. If I mention the word deferred maintenance, would you understand what I was saying? Too many years in a row they have kicked the maintenance down the road. If you kick a can down the road pretty soon, you got a lot of cans piled up. we got a lot of wore-out buildings. I say all that to say I want to be transparent in the shape of the camp. It's not all perfect. It's a camp. But it can be with your help. Camp means the world. So we had to develop a plan. We had a bridge that had been condemned to go into pool camp so you couldn't get across Canoe Creek to get, to, to get up to pool camp where all the magic happens. So we had to build a bridge, $100,000. They estimated $200,000. But then we, as, a, as the Lord would bless us, we found some concrete girders that had been turned down for a project in Georgia, and we were able to purchase them for half the price, 40 feet. So we bought the concrete girders, and now that $200,000 project was 100000 And we had a donor that gave us that. Can I say amen? And then, not only was the, the construction of the bridge taking place simultaneously over in the lodge kitchen, we had a, a vent hood that had been condemned. The ancillary fire retardant system had, had been just completely outdated. And so, somebody came in and said, we need a new vent hood, $83,000. I mean, it looks pretty, but $83,000 is, $83, is a lot of money. Nina Reeves Foundation through an interview and a grant proposal, gave us 76000 so that we could help complete that project. It should be completed in a, about a week and a half. The bridge should be completed maybe by the middle of May, just in time for us to host your children and your grandchildren for summer camp. But there's other projects that take place. We had, it, we had to build a staff. I was two weeks being at Camp Sumatanga, I've been there two weeks, and it was the coldest part of the year. And so I'm going down the road, and I hear an alarm. And I said, I didn't know we had alarms at Sumatanga. <laughs> my maintenance director quit. So it was just my wife and myself. So I didn't know anything about a sprinkler system, but the, the pressure dropped off this dry sprinkler system, and so it filled with water, and now the alarm's going off. So I'm trying to shut it off, and I can't figure out what this. And luckily, I figured it out. It's amazing what you can figure out when an alarm's going off. 
we got that fixed, and so we enjoyed our rest of the day, and we drained the line, and then, and then the next, that was the night that it got so cold, and the next day, uh, I'm, I'm messing around with my children, and, and I'm building a fire in a log cabin, and I go to wash my hands, and there's no water. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the camp is built on top of an aquifer. And so we, we have the water pumped up with a well. We have two, two well pumps, and, and so ADM monitors our water in. We're sampling it all the time. We pump it up to a 100,000-gallon tank, and the tank then distributes water to the camp. So I pump water in. I, I have to deal with ADM then, and then while the water's at camp, it's beating us up. It's busting our pipes and busting our valves and killing all of our flappers and our commodes. That's not very sexy to talk about at a, in the pulpit at Alabaster First. I know y'all are used to a little more uh, articulation than that, but water's, uh, water's tough. Water's tough. And then when we send the water out to our treatment plant, then we deal with ADM again. It's like a mini city. It's like a mini city. So that night, the coldest night ever, I, I had no water, and I, I started looking for the leaks, and I couldn't find a leak, and I went around behind Hutto. Everybody knows where Hutto is. So I go around behind Hutto, and there were 75,000 gallons headed towards Canoe Creek oh. on the ground. The sprinkler system had burst. Water was everywhere. And so I'd been there, I'd been there maybe a month and a half. I thought they were going to fire me. I'd ruined two sprinkler systems. <laughs> $14,000 repair. It's a wore out camp. But it's full of love and grace for each of you. It's a camp that means the world to us. See, the camp has this thing about passion. Passion can be a double-edged sword, right? It can, we can have passion to do something miraculous or we can have passion to do something not so miraculous. And so it's that passion that I want to tap in today. We needed staff while we were at camp, and God's blessed us with a good food service director, with a good maintenance director. We've hired an amazing summer camp director. We've had the blessing of retaining our administrative assistant and reservation coordinator. God has blessed us. So I say that to say that every time we come up against a hurdle, God has opened the door for camp to survive. And I believe that. And I have that hope that Nehemiah has shared with us through this scripture. We had, we had electrical panels at our RV park, and a church graciously donated money so that we can have those repaired. It was $7,500. And, and now our children walking through, I'm, comfort, I'm comforted, and I'm, I'm an honored and privileged to say that they're not going to get in harm's way with a poor electrical system. This past weekend, this past week, Gerald Dean... First United Methodist Church came, and they decided to take over our boys' staff hut. They cleaned it out, cleaned it up, installed air conditioners, took all the beds out, going to buy new beds and new mattresses, and they're going to redo the kitchen. People like you, loving people that are passionate about camp. That's God opening up another door. There's so much more that needs to be done. There's so much more that needs to be done. But I, I want, as my role as executive director, to be honest and transparent, but also to tell you that we have great hope of what camp will be in the coming years. There's more to be done, but there's always going to be more that needs to be done. So when you heard that I was coming today, you probably said, well, he's going to ask for money. That's really why he's here. And, and no, that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to ask for money, but I'm here to let you know that Camp Sumatonga is your camp. It's in your conference, and it'll survive because of you. I think it'll survive if you do three things. And this is the so what part of this message today. It'll survive if you are present at camp. I'm going to invite you to come to camp. If you don't have anything going on, if you don't have any programming that you're there to be involved with, just come to camp. Sit by our lake. Come at the evening at, right at dusk and you'll hear the owls call you. During the day, the geese will fly over and let you know they're there. If you're lucky, you won't see a snake. 
<laughs> you can watch the fish jump. The squirrels play. You can hear nature come alive. Just come to camp. Be present. Maybe just come and be quiet and hear God speak to your heart. It's funny how that happens. I was leaving the log cabin after about a month of being at camp, and I was reminded of how precious and sacred that place is. COVID was still in full force, and we had basically shut our state down, and, and the camps were still closed, and the gates were put up to keep people out of the buildings because we had no staff to monitor and keep things safe. And so I almost made it back to the office, and there was a little SUV parked in front of the entrance to the lodge. This elderly couple had taken a table, come to camp for lunch, had two chairs, and they brought their sack lunch and was eating lunch at a gate, at an entrance, at a camp. That's how special this place is. It reminds me of that scripture as if I can just touch the fringe of his garment, it'll be enough to be healed. Come to camp and see and feel all that it has to offer. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is pray for us. Pray for both Shannon and I. Make sure that we're doing the things that we're called to do. Make sure that we are making decisions based on what the kingdom of God might can look like. Pray for our staff. Pray that we can get more staff. I, I preached at Coleman first last week, and as a result of preaching there, I, had a, I, I hired another kitchen staff member by Tuesday of that same week. God is good. We need more staff. I need more maintenance. I need more kitchen staff. I need people that have a heart for ministry, not just for a job, but have a heart for ministry. Because I believe if we, do, if we do this camp thing and we do it in a particular way, and we make people feel at home through Christ-like hospitality, amazing food, and a cleanly place to lay their head, I think we're going to have something special. But I need your help to do that. I need you praying for us to make sure that we can accomplish that. The third thing I'm going to ask you to do is trust us. Trust me. Trust that camp is being guided in a proper way with the right mission and vision. Our mission at Camp Sumatonga is to have sacred encounters with God through nature and nurture. I can do that. We can provide that opportunity. We can provide a space so that God can touch one's heart in such a way that they're called into ministry or they're called into a relationship or they're called into a job opportunity. God is there willing to talk to your heart and it's done it for over the years with tons and tons of your youth. Pulling them into leadership. We had alumni weekend this past couple of weeks and one of the things that they kept sharing as they told story after story going around the table, 40 or 50 of our young adults that were then counselors and staff at, at camp, the thing that they said was the trust that someone gave me to be in charge of someone's spiritual growth was overwhelming and changed my life forever. The relationships gained at camp were unbelievable. So those three things that you can do, you can be present at camp, you can pray for camp, you can trust camp, you can do all of those things while sending your youth and your grandchildren to camp. See, without you, we're just a camp. We're ground in a place called Greasy Cove in Gallon, Alabama. Without your youth, we're just building in land. But we need you to be a part of the rebuilding that Nehemiah felt, that I felt, that camp needs. So here's the deal. Uh, if you've noticed in your bulletin, I had a title to this message, and I haven't spoken about it one bit, but the title is, What Books Will You Author? And that seems like an odd title based on what I've said, but uh, this is why. I have favorite scripture. Uh, this scripture 
was scripture that meant the world to me at my time in seminary. When, whenever I, I left to go to Atlanta, Georgia for seminary, I, I was discerning all the books of the Bible and trying to understand scripture. And, and I had a little bit of a problem with only recording three years of Jesus' life. And, and, then, and then having such an emphasis there, and then it stopped the resurrection, right? And so certainly the book, uh, the, the Bibles of the book contain much more of that. But I thought there had to be more. And so John 21, 25, the, the, I'm sorry, the last, gospel, the, the last verse in the Gospel of John, and, and, and it reads like this. Jesus did many other things as well. And I suppose that everything that was, he did was written down. The world could not contain the books that would be written. Now think about it like this. This is what I did. I put it in perspective. So every time I do something in the name of Jesus, I'm writing a sentence or a paragraph in a book for the kingdom of God. So every time you, you, you show an act of kindness, every time you donate money, every time you call somebody when they're sick and check up on them and tell them I love you, Every time you give somebody a ride to a doctor's appointment, every time you lift up the ministries of this church, every time you do something in the name of Jesus, you're writing a verse, a chapter, a book in the name of Jesus for the kingdom of God. So as I'm running over time and as, as you're wore out and your stomachs are growling, hear me say this, right? What books will you author? In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blessing of allowing me to speak to you today. And, and I pray, I pray that you include Camp Simatonga as your presence, your prayers, and your trust. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You join me in this prayer. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the way that you speak to our hearts. Whether it be John 21, 25, or whether it be the story of Nehemiah, Father, you've given us mentors in our life so that we can learn and gain knowledge of your will. We pray for Camp Sumatanga, Father, and for the ministries of this church. May they be forever connected. We pray for those online, and then may they feel the calling in their heart to be a part of this ministry called Sumatanga, the place of rest and vision that you've created for us all. We pray for our summer camps ministries and those that are part of that minister and ministry. And may they, may they minister to our young people in such a way that gives them hope and guidance for a future. Father, I thank you for your love and your forgiveness. It's in your son's name I make this prayer. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd, Lead Us.
So go forth now, looking to see what is that chapter, that sentence, that paragraph that Jesus is wanting to write with you in the lives of your, your loved ones, those that you meet. Go in peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.